everyone. I'm Rachel Poli here with Ari Meglin, and we're your hosts for the Merry Writer Podcast. We're on episode 132, and this week's question is, how do you become an audiobook narrator? Before we begin, don't forget to subscribe to the podcast wherever you're listening so you never miss a show. And if you enjoyed this episode, please give it a like, write a review, and share it with your friends. Now, please help us welcome author and audiobook narrator Rachel V. White to the show. Rachel, thank you so much for joining us. It's really great to have you on the podcast. Thanks so much for having me. I'm so excited. I'm so excited to be here. It's the Rachel episode. I'm excited you're here too. <laughs> I feel like I'm outnumbered. I'm just going to say that now. I feel like I may have to change my name to Rachel just for this episode. You Gonna should. Say- it's a good name. <laughs> it's, a, it's a very good name. Please do. <laughs> Even spell it the same way too. <laughs> yeah. Nobody ever yeah. spells it that way anymore. No. Anytime I tell people my name, they're like, it's a, is it A-E-L? I'm like, no, yes. you put in extra work. Stop it. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> okay, Rachel, would you like to tell us a bit about your writing background? Like how long you've been writing? Where did you start? And also obviously about anything like that. Yeah, Yeah, sure. So I've been a writer for as long as I can remember, really. I I would type the beginnings of stories on my family's computer when I was a kid. And when I was in school, I would just write a whole bunch of chapters in my school notebooks all the time during class, whenever I got bored. I even went through a phase of writing role play stories with my friends where we would pass entire notebooks in class instead of individual like folded pieces of papers, you know, in the days before texting. So we would pass notebooks in class. Luckily, the teachers would never confiscate them because, you know, they'd have to read an entire notebook of nonsense. (laughs) Anyway, but I wasn't much of a story finisher back then. I wrote the beginnings of chapters a lot and played with characters a lot, but I didn't finish a lot of things. So that's been a more difficult journey for me since I started pursuing a writing career. I, uh, I, I feel that very much. I am not great at finishing. I will write the ending first and I will write the beginning, but actually like finishing a whole project it's not my strongest suit at the moment I really like how you used to role play with your friends because I used to do the exact same thing with my sister except we used to create our own forums uh using a a website called pro boards I don't know if you've ever heard of it but we used to create our own forums and we would have people come on and we would role play based off of our favorite book series, for example, like the Warrior series by Aaron Hunter, or we would role play X-Men or Pokemon. And uh, yeah, we, it was a lot of fun. Also, I have to say, when you said I wrote the beginnings of stories on the family's computer, like that hits home because we all grew up with the big bulky desktop that everybody had to share. And we'd be on the computer typing away at a story that we were never going to finish, but everybody else in the family would be like, okay, it's time to get off. And it's like, no, I mean, but also the other thing is too, we had to write stories because my mom was talking on the phone and I couldn't go on the internet while she was talking on the landline. Yep. That, yep. That is exactly true. (laughs) Yeah, making us feel really old. I mean, when I go back to that, it's like Windows 3.0 is what I started on. That's the age I'm... (laughs) I don't even remember. I I don't even remember. It's just ancient now. (laughs) Yeah, I don't even remember either. I don't even know how you remember that, Ari. (laughs) Good for you for remembering that, though. Oh, yeah. It's it's one of those things. You remember something that's really embarrassing. It's like, yep, forget like uh, XP or Vista or ME or any of that. No, it's like right back to the beginning when it was like Windows 3.0. Probably because it was the first one that I, I ever had. And because nobody in my family knew how to use computers, I was the one, even though I was only young, that had to read the manuals and figure out how to use it and then connect the, you know, the dot matrix printer, <laughs> things like that. So stays with you. Stays that with is you. impressive. I know. Good for you. <laughs> Well, anyway, this week we're going to be talking about how do you become an audiobook narrator. So I'm going to jump in to the topic and ask you, Rachel, how did you even get into narrating audiobooks? Well, um, for me, it kind of started young. I did. I haven't wanted to be an audiobook narr- narrator quite as long as I've been a writer. But before I realized I could actually become a narrator, I remember recording myself attempting to read at least one book I liked on tape with a friend of mine. I didn't make it very far though. Um, Actually back 
in the day when Twilight first came out, ooh, Twilight, um, I was kind of obsessed with it. So um, I was the first person to read it in my English class. And I finished it in like probably three days or less. And once I was done with it, I wanted my best friend to read it because she hadn't even had a chance to read it yet. And she told me she would, but then days would go by and I'd remind her again and she just never picked it up, even though she seemed really interested in the story. So I told her, if you're not going to read it, then I'm going to read it to you. And I did. I read it to her cover to cover during lunch, at home over the phone, whenever we were hanging out. And when I got to the end, my friend said she liked me reading to her better than she would have liked reading the book on her own. And then I thought, you know, yeah, yeah, that was really fun. I think I'd really like to do that as a job someday. So then fast forward a few years in 2019, I, one of my writing group friends found a free course online that taught the basics of how to get started with audiobook narration. And so I just jumped on it. And to be honest, you don't really even need a course to get started, really. The course, so the course was free, so, you know, didn't have to pay for it or anything. And most of the information, you just have to kind of gather in one place to be able to get started. I've made free profiles on ACX, which is Amazon's platform. And I've also made a profile on Findaway Voices, which I'm less experienced with so far. But those are great ways to find audiobook work. And creating a profile really is the easy part. Um, because you don't necessarily have to have specific qualifications to create a profile. Anyone can do it. But I know my two-ish decades of acting experience and my ability to do a handful of at least half-decent accents has helped me a lot with my work. That is such a sweet story, how you got into audiobook narrating because you tried, you, you read a book to a friend. I think that's adorable and I love that. Twilight was actually one of those books that I never read. I never really got into them. But I think that's great that Twilight was kind of your push. I didn't realize how easy it is. I put, I'll say easy loosely, but I have, I recently heard of ACX, like maybe about a year ago. And I didn't know that it was so simple that if you wanted to try narrating audiobooks, you could just simply go on Amazon, go on ACX and create a profile and start auditioning to, uh, to books. Like no one, like it's not something that people teach you. And it's great that you found that free course. And I'm sure that did help you, even though it maybe didn't have like all the nuts and bolts to it, but I'm sure it would give you a push in the right direction at least. Yeah, it definitely gave me a good push. Um, and yeah, it was, it surprised me too how easy it was. Cause I thought that I would have to like audition to like an agent or something to get a job ever. And so I felt like it was out of my reach, but um, the second I found out that anybody could do it, I was like, oh, well, I guess I might as well just go for it because the real, the real um, barrier for people is that you have to sound good. You have to audition for things in order to get work. So um, the rights holder of the project has to listen to you so they can hear what your um, audio sounds like if you've got the right equipment that they want um, for the audio quality that they want. So Really, anybody can make a profile, but not everybody can get work. So that that was helpful for sure. I always wonder about like, because you mentioned accents and that's something I would never feel comfortable doing. Um, not because I couldn't do accents, but I, I just feel like I'd be touching on doing something that sounds really stereotypical and that could be really bad, especially if you're an English person. It's just always seems to be a bad idea. But also... I've noticed with some people, especially certain, um, wait, where's my brain going? I've also noticed some people have accents that are what I would consider neutral. Does that make sense? And I found that there's, especially in certain places in America, there's this lovely neutral accent. Obviously you have very strong accents, you know, like I'm going to try and remember some, like, is Mississippi quite a strong accent or Bronx or something like that but like my accent is English but it's not the English of like Hugh Grant or Kira Knightley or that sort of softer southern English accent of like Patrick Stewart it's gravelier and rough because I'm from the north of England and we don't talk nice up there 
So I always worry that you would need to have either a neutral accent or, or like you said, have a really good talent for changing accents to be able to give books a bit more flavour, if I can think. So, yeah, I would always be more worried about that. Do you think that is a thing or do you think it's like, oh, people like lots of different accents, even crappy Northern English ones? I definitely wouldn't call your accent crappy. I find it very awesome. Thank you very much. But uh, that's that's something that I actually haven't thought about before. But I, I would think that a lot of people are looking for neutral accents that can expand in different directions. But there are a lot of projects that say, I want this accent specifically. And they can put that in their uh, project notes for people to see before they audition. So th there is demand for a lot of different accents that you can find. Okay, yeah, that's good to know because it's just it's one of those things I've always whenever I've heard any audiobooks, it's always been these lovely, like I can't think I can only use neutral as the word because I think any other word wouldn't sound the way I want it to sound. And like your accent is lovely. I would not have been able to point out where in America you were from, mainly because I don't know that many places and the different accents, but it's not so strong that I think, oh yeah, that's you know, that's definitely a Texas accent or something like that. So you have this really nice voice that I think, yeah, I can totally see that working um, for audiobook narration. Whereas I couldn't imagine hearing myself do audiobook narration. I mean, I barely hear myself when I'm doing the podcast and I'm editing. It's like, oh, God, stop. Horrible, horrible <laughs> while I'm editing it. So, but that's just me. Your voice definitely does not sound terrible. Um, I'm actually, ironically, I'm not a big fan of audiobooks. I I'm really picky about my narrators and the voices that I listen to reading to me, but uh, have not gotten annoyed by either of your voices. So high praise, I guess. You're so nice. <laughs> <Good to hear. laughs> oh, man. Okay, so with that, let's move on to my first question. My, my first official question. I did throw that extra one at you. What equipment do you need to be a good audiobook narrator? Because I assume you, anyone could use any equipment, but if you want to be a good audiobook narrator, what's the best equipment? Yeah, people definitely, a lot of people on ACX just have a USB connected microphone to their computer and they just go bare minimum with it. And sometimes they do get hired still, but um, if you want it to sound really, really good, there are definitely things that you have to do. Um, so in order to record a decent audiobook, you're going to need first a digital audio workstation installed on your computer. Some people use a free one called Audacity, um, which has pretty good functionality. Um, but there are also others such as Adobe Audition, which my uh, editor uses. And then there's Reaper and then Studio One, which is the one that I use for my recording. And this is where you record your audio and edit and master and all that type of stuff. So after that, you need a good condenser microphone, not just a random microphone that you'd use at concerts or, yeah, a lot of microphones have specialties to them. So a condenser microphone has the right sensitivity for audiobooks, apparently, but I honestly don't know much more about it than that. Apparently it just picks up nuances in the voice better than a lot of other microphones. Um, I use a Rode NT1A, but there's a wide range of brands and types you can choose from. It's just important to get a microphone and connecting cables that won't add static to your recording. So as long as the connection's good and the microphone's good, you won't get a whole bunch of feedback from it. So in front of the microphone, you'll also need a pop filter, which is which will soften parts of our speech called plosives. So a pop filter, uh, like on headphone microphones, they have kind of a pop filter over them already, the soft part over the microphone. In front of the microphone that I have, I've installed a pop filter in front of it. So it stops plosives. Um, Plosives are the sounds that we make that release sudden bursts of air, just in case people don't know, um, like P's and T's. Pop filters also give you a cleaner sound, especially when you're using a condenser microphone, which is, again, more sensitive. And last, but certainly not any less important, you need a pair of over-the-ear headphones so you can block out outside noise and be able to hear your audio even while you're recording. That part threw me off when I first started recording because it 
I can hear myself while I'm talking. And if it's even a little bit off, it's so frustrating. But uh, it's, it's really helpful because if you can hear your audio through your headphones, you're probably recording. <laughs> and there are lots of people that record an entire chapter only to find none of it got recorded and it's so frustrating. So that's, that's a little fail safe for you. Oh my gosh, that would be awful, especially if you, you thought, oh, this is going to be a really good chapter, I've been enunciated correctly, only to find out, it's like, no, do it all again. Yeah. It's actually interesting, because I have that, I had to double check, but I have that microphone, the uh, Rode NT1A, and I have a pop filter, and I only found out, like, three days ago, that apparently this one is directional, that I didn't know. My, because uh, I stole this, this is my partner, because <laughs> he's a musician, and I stole this, um, at the beginning and haven't given it back <laughs> so <laughs> um but yeah he was like he, he sort of made a comment and I was like oh yeah, I'm recording he went oh yeah you know it's directional I'm like I did not know that so there may be times when I've been recording and didn't realize it wasn't in the right position and it's probably not been as good so yeah I think getting a microphone and then knowing how to use it is a good idea because I did not <laughs> and uh, it's good that you mentioned Reaper because I use Audacity with the podcast because it's free and it's easy and it's a little podcast but my partner has reaper and i have heard good things about that so it's like oh look at me i've got most of the equipment so, you really do uh, just not the good accent but no that's uh <laughs> it's, it's it's weird because you don't think oh yeah you're definitely gonna need specific equipment you think yeah you need a mic and that's it not you need a good mic and you need headphones and you need really good software and like I know you have a, like a studio and everything so you know to make yourself better at being at doing them it's almost like giving yourself the best chance isn't it if you have all the good equipment and then obviously you do your best with it it gives you a head start above other people who as you said just have that USB mic that probably crackles in the background so yeah okay that's my thoughts I think I knew that you had a Rode microphone and I'm actually glad Rachel that you mentioned that you have a Rode microphone because I've been looking to upgrade mine and that was actually the brand that I was looking at. So that makes me feel a whole lot better. But I also wanted to ask a quick little follow-up question because you mentioned that your editor uses Adobe Audition. And I was actually going to ask when you finish recording, who actually edits are you supposed to edit or do you give it to the author and they edit and they have an editor but you just mentioned that you have an editor so i'm confused how does that process work it's a very convoluted process really <laughs> <laughs> because there are some narrators who will do the editing themselves but it's a lot of work and it's a huge learning curve so for me, I found my editor, uh, she was a friend of mine, and she said, oh, I do, I've done some video and sound editing, I could, I could give it a try, and I'm like, oh, really? Well, here you go, and she did an amazing job, because she knows how to get into the waveform and be like, oh, I see that noise right there, it should not be there, and she just scrubs it out, and I'm like, that's amazing, I have no idea how to do that, I don't want to take the time to learn how to do that, I am an actor. <laughs> I'm so yeah anyway um but so I didn't want to learn how to do all the editing stuff and she's so good at it so really that's part of where the pay goes for a lot of the narrators is either paying them for their own editing time or paying somebody else for the editing the proofing the mastering the stuff that they might not know how to do or not want to take the time to do because their money maker is their voice and their talent I didn't even know that you could do that, like get into the waveform like that, because I mean, I think I do a pretty decent job editing the podcast episodes. Obviously, things slip by here and there. I apparently don't know what I'm doing as much as I thought I did. Because you said, like, obviously, the editing is quite intense. I mean, our podcast at the longest, I think it's been an hour and 10 minutes. Most of the time, they're between 20, 35 minutes. And oh my God, it takes ages to edit them. We, it's the worst part of the podcast, listening to our own voices and finding every little <gasps> or that we make. I'm going to have to, Rachel, you have to remember to leave these noises. In. Oh, I will. Make some more. Go ahead. Because <laughs> I'm forever like whipping them. I'd like, no. But it's, it, I mean, and those are really short. I mean, even a 20 minute one seems to take hours. 
I couldn't imagine editing like an eight hour book. It's like, it just boggles my mind that someone does that. So I, that is definitely something. If I ever did this, I would be outsourcing. I don't care how much, because it was like, I'm not doing that. I am. I don't have enough hours left in my life to do that. Just saying. I couldn't agree more. <laughs> the funny thing is though, um, that on top of that editing that I get, I also kind of do some of my own editing, very, very basic, but like I'll take out my own bad takes. If there's a take, for example, uh, if there's a really, really long sentence, normally uh, when I'm reading, I'll put in a breath mark for myself so I know where a natural point to breathe is. But if I haven't done that, I just go, 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 go. And then I run out of air and I'm like, and I'm going to do that again. Or if I mess up words, which I often do, or if my voice cracks or anything like that, unlike a podcast, I can just nope that right out of the recording and try again so that my editor has a little bit less work to do. So I help her out in that way, but it still it still does take hours. The, the general consensus is that it usually takes about four hours of work behind every finished hour of audio, which is a lot. <laughs> That's nuts. Whoa. Now, wait. Okay, so I have another question. When you record for the books, do you record like a few chapters at a time and then send that to your editor? Or do you just... Say, so here's the whole book. Have fun. Oh, my goodness. Recording an entire book. Oh, that would be a lot. Um, I am a mom of three kids, three very, very noisy children, and a husband who walks heavily. So I can't record when anybody else is home, really, or awake. So um, I know at least one of my books I recorded almost entirely between the hours of 10 and 12 p.m. Well, 10 p.m. and 12 p.m. AM. So uh, lots of late nights. But um, since I have my attention so divided at this point in my life, I'm able to record about a chapter a session. So I spend an hour recording the chapter probably with all my flubs and blubs. And especially because I'm 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 honestly less experienced because I've only I've only been in this business for a few years. I haven't been here for decades. So there's a lot of flubs and blubs and things that I'm still figuring out. So that takes me about an hour. And then I go through the chapter. I listen to it, which is very difficult, especially when I'm doing an accent, which is, oh my goodness, like I can do them. But if somebody says dance, monkey dance, I'm like, I don't know what to do. <laughs> I don't know if I could just do that right now anyway. But listening to accents for me is it's sometimes hard. The more crazy the character voice gets, the more I'm like, eh, is that really good? Are people going to, is that believable? Oh man. But so I listen through it and that takes me another, about another hour to be like, oh, I missed a word here. Got to retake that. Got to make sure the audio matches as well. So sometimes it even takes me a few takes, even if I get the sentence right, maybe I won't be as close or as far away from the microphone as I should be. I might have used a different volume in my voice. And so that can take me a couple of times as well. So that the whole process will take me about two hours per chapter, hopefully. And so then I'll just send that off to her and she'll edit it, give me back any corrections. But otherwise, I just move on to the next chapter and so on and so forth. And I like to go linearly. Some people don't, but I feel like if I didn't go linearly, there would be definitely a point where like drastic change in character happens and I missed it all the way over there so I just start from the beginning because I remember things better but yeah slow process that sounds hard <laughs> wow I didn't like I didn't realize how much time that you would get I mean obviously you think of narrating audiobooks like I knew you don't just sit there open up the book and then you read it like a story as if you're just reading it to yourself but I never thought about the microphone being too close or too far, or you use like a slightly different tone or you use a slightly different volume. Like that's, that's a lot. Like I, I'm not, I'm not a good listener. I say, as I run a podcast, I'm not a good listener at all. So if I had tried narrating audiobooks and then I had to listen it back to myself, I don't think I, my editor would have a crap ton of work. <laughs> With that said, you mentioned that you have three kids 
and a husband. So how do you set up a good working environment to narrate your books? Well, the working environment is where the studio comes in. Uh, my studio is very helpful, but people have all kinds of solutions to the making a good environment for narration. They rent studios, they build their own booths, which is awesome. I am not that handy. Um, they, they can even make their walk-in closets work for them. As long as you have enough clothes in there, you just want to reduce the amount of area that sound can bounce off of. So if you've got a walk-in closet that is packed floor to ceiling with clothes, it might work, honestly. So what you need is a sound treated or at least insulated space. But beyond the space itself, you have to make sure the location of the space is also as quiet as you can manage. So kids, husband. My first at-home setup was in my basement in my, the house that I lived in before this one that I'm living in now. So I, I bought myself a Studio Bricks booth, which is really, really high quality. It takes six months to get here. <laughs> it was totally worth it. It it cost a lot of money and it came from Spain and I'm very happy to have it, but it, it was a lot. Um, it's a great one, uh, but as amazing as the sound treatment inside the booth was, my house was still next to the freeway and frequently used train tracks and life flight helicopters flew over all the time on the way to the hospital. And I tried to make sure that none of that made it into my recordings, but my editor often had me re-record portions of the chapters where she could hear background noise that I'd missed. Even in a quiet environment, you'd have to make sure no one around your workspace, workspace is talking or fidgeting in a squeaky chair or even walking around on the floor above you, like my husband, if I'm downstairs. You even have to consider what you're wearing to record. If you've got any jangling jewelry or noisy, scratchy fabric, your mic's going to pick all of that up. And also a lesser known thing or a lesser thought about thing. I know I didn't think about it at the time. Um, you should also wear deodorant in your booth. It sounds really random, but it's true. It's so hard to be in a tiny room with yourself when you haven't showered or you haven't put on deodorant. It gets so hot and it stinks so bad. So hygiene, everybody, it's important even when you're a narrator and work from home in your pajamas. I think that's a good lesson for everybody to hear just in general. Keep good hygiene and wear deodorant. <laughs> no matter where you are, you should just remember to do it. <laughs> Sorry. <that's laughs> Wasn't expecting that <laughs> at all. Even take, I take your time. <laughs> Oh, I think a thing like that, you know. Nobody ever mentioned this to me. <laughs> <laughs> it's sound advice. It, it really is. I can only imagine. But um, I really, I like how you have a fancy uh, booth to record. And that must have been a great investment for you. I mean, for it to come all the way from Spain. And I mean, that's that sounds amazing. I'm going to have to look that up when we finish recording. Because uh, I'm sure, I'm sure it's really cool. Um, I'm stuck on the deodorant bit. Hold on. <laughs> just say something. Well, I could distract you a little bit from the deodorant bit or let you collect your thoughts by talking about the booth a little bit more because it, it, it goes together like Legos kind of. Oh, that's even is, better. Yeah. It's got like a bunch of little wooden dowels. So you can, that was the, that was a big selling port, point for me because I knew that I wasn't going to live in a tiny townhouse forever we needed a bigger space. So I wanted something that I knew would be able to move with me and retain sound treatment quality. Cause a lot of things, once you tear them down, they aren't as good anymore. But with this, you just slide it out and take all the pieces with you and slide them all back in. And it's heavy, especially the door. The door is like 150 pounds on its own. But if you've got a strong set of friends or strong family members, they can help you and it's it's a pain to put together, but at least you can. But I mean, when you describe it as Legos, like you can you can tell people that it's fun to put together. It is kind of fun. It's kind of fun to put together and until you get to the top. It's exciting, too, because you know what you're going to be using it for, for obviously. So you're like, oh, once this is all built, it's like I can finally start. So, yeah, you have that like that extra motivation. Yep. It was definitely a motivator. I was so excited. 
I'm going to circle back around and also throw another question at you because you mentioned like putting in a mark for like breath. Yeah. That never occurred to me ever that that would be such a part, important part to like, especially if you say you've got like a chunky bit of dialogue or something or a prose that you're reading, having those breaths, so you're not going <gasps> in the middle of it. <laughs> yep. That's really important. <laughs> and just as another thing, as a fantasy writer with all those weird sounding names when you deal with authors if you record fantasy or sci-fi or any i mean you could be a victorian thing with a really unusual name do you get like a list of pronunciations or do you ask for pronunciation because it'd be awful to record the whole book and then realize you've been mispronouncing the protagonist's name compared to what the author knows it as so do you like get a, a set of information like this is how all these locations and people are pronounced so you get it right? That is something that is not standardized and I feel like it should be because that's really important. There are there are times when um, I've actually had a friend who had her book turned into an audiobook, and she was like, oh, I thought that pronunciation was really obvious and it wasn't and it's all over the book. I guess it's just going to have to be that. That's fine. Yep. It's that now. Okay, cool. Because it wasn't like super off or super awful sounding. It was just different than she anticipated. So I, I, I like to ask, I think as, I think any rights holder should just be like, and once you have the job, here's a list, have a list, enjoy. So I, I think that's, I think that's a really important part of the process that and a narrator should definitely ask if there's any doubt whatsoever in their mind. And going back to the, the markings thing, it's not just, I think the marking part is really, really cool because before I start recording, I read through the book um, for, for all the continuity things that I need to know. Like I can take notes on characters, if how their voices sound, like if there's a description three quarters of the way through the book. I want to know that from the very, very beginning. But I also, sometimes I'll mark, I'll mark how sentences should sound. Like if I want the tone to be a certain way, I'll just add a little mark there. So I know, oh, it's the, that's the inflection I'm going for. I want this to sound sarcastic. It's not supposed to just sound like straight talk. So there's a whole bunch of marking. And as a musician, I used to mark music all the time. So this is kind of like marking my music all over again. It's super fun. That's an, I never thought of that. Like even little things like having like marks to say, yep, inflect here or this character's, you know, it's, they're raising in volume because they're starting to shout, but you don't find that out until the end of the dialogue tag, you know, things like that. And when marking, I highlight different different characters in different colors because the same thing when you get to the dialogue tag and finally find out who's talking I, ca I can't do that <laughs> I have to know already my brain fixes it really fast when I'm just reading to Blake by myself in my head but it's really helpful to mark them honestly I am learning so much more I, I mean I already um I've already read some stuff about it and obviously we had some notes that we'd seen of yours but like the extra stuff you have to think about that you wouldn't, it wouldn't have even dawned on me yet. Yeah, you need to think about this. You need to know who's about to speak, especially if you've got an accent and you have to put that accent back on for that character. So you said that the author doesn't necessarily give you a list of like character pronunciations or anything like that. So my first question is, what does the author give you? And also when you do narrate the books, do you prefer to do it through ebook or through like a paperback copy? Or do you have like a hard printed manuscript? Cause you just mentioned that you highlight certain characters and stuff. So how does, what? what? <laughs> <laughs> so the, so for the first question about what, what we get. So if it's a self-published book, we will get it from the author. But if it's not, if it's a traditionally published book, the author almost has no control over it whatsoever. So we'll get it from the rights holder. And so we will have no communication with the author whatsoever, which is explains how some things end up into audiobooks that authors are like, it's not what I wanted, <laughs> but it is what it is. But so really what you get is it's not really standardized at all. The only thing that you always get is an audition script. And that's what you audition with. That's what's on the 
project listing, you can download the script and audition with that. But after that, everything is just kind of up in the air. So uh, it's really important to have a communication line open so that you can ask questions, I feel like. I don't know if that's standardized either. I mean, I, I'm on ACX, you have messaging that you can do. But you know, if you're in the middle of a chapter and find a word that you don't know how to pronounce and they haven't, they can't respond with it <clears throat> and they can't respond within like five minutes, then ah, so <laughs> I don't know. Uh, there's definitely, I, I definitely do feel like there should be a standard there, but there, but there really isn't. There's a lot of things that can go wonky, at least on, at least on ACX, which is, you know, it can still be very, very much worth it, but you gotta take it with a grain of salt, I guess. The second thing about the format that I use, I very much prefer PDFs uh, of the manuscript. I have on my iPad, I have uh, an app that lets me go in and annotate things. A lot of narrators use iAnnotate, which I tried and it was, there was a lot of a learning curve there. It scared me a little bit. So <laughs> I, use, I use an app called Flexel on my iPad. And so I'll just pull up a PDF, can mark it and highlight it however I want, just like it's a piece of paper, but it's not nearly as noisy as paper. And it doesn't take up as much space as an open book would. So I don't, I don't use, I don't use a Kindle, I don't use a Nook or any e-readers or anything like that. I just use the app. I don't even want to know what people did before iPads. Like with with books on tape, how did they do that? I don't know how they did that. I don't know how you edit that. I don't know what you read from. I don't know. <laughs> well, yeah, because I mean, you brought up a good point. If you have a paperback or you have just the paper copy in front of you, obviously it's going to make noise. You'd have to mute yourself every time you get to turn the page. So, yeah, I, I like that. That that's a That's a good idea. That is. And again, more things we're learning that we have no idea about. And I am going to circle back because I love doing that. Circle back around. When we're talking about pronunciation, being a very anally retentive, obsessive person that I am, I would probably feel more comfortable recording my own pronunciation guide and then sending it to the narrator rather than writing it down. I would probably write it, you know, this is how it's pronounced. And then I'd still write it in the way that my brain was like, yeah, that's right. And the other person wouldn't get it right. Would that be something that could be done can you can you send sort of audio through to to be on, on whichever systems you use or would that be like oh god they're sending a weird thing you have to listen to but to me that would be the best way of getting the correct pronunciation like directly from the mouth of the author or some publisher who's got the rights or something and probably wouldn't care as much yeah that's uh, that's a fantastic idea and um after the audition once you get the job there's a there's a bit called the first 15 minutes where you get to hear a 15 minute sample of the book, basically. Like the, the narrator's already been hired, but at this point you can say, uh, never mind, this isn't gonna work. But I really like to do that kind of a thing where like these are the character voices that I'm thinking of. Tell me if you like these or if you need me to change them. Hear like pronunciations of things that I'm not clear on. That's a perfect place for those. Cool, cool. That's well, good to know. Storing it all up here, you never know. <laughs> okay, with that said, let's get back to our regular programming. Next question. <laughs> How do you decide which projects to take on? That is a good question. There are several ways that a narrator can decide. So ACX, again, is the site that I'm most familiar with right now. And when a narrator looks at a listed project on ACX, they can see how much the rights holder is offering to pay for the narration, as well as the book's Amazon ranking, the blurb for the book, the genre, and the type of voice actor or skills that they need, like with accents and um, tone and stuff like that, that they're looking for. So that usually gives you a pretty good idea of what you'd be signing up for before you even audition. So personally, I've focused on fantasy so far, and I try to steer I try to steer clear of erotica or anything else that I would feel uncomfortable reading or having people know that I read and listen to me read. Yeah, no, 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 not doing that. <laughs> I'm still trying to decide if I wanted to want to read any profanity or not. I'm kind of on the fence about that, which is it's a whole other can of worms. But 
right now I choose not to. So, but with a lot of genres and especially in the fantasy books I've done, you do often have to use a bunch of different accents. So if a book is listed as requiring certain accents, I want to make sure I can do those. So basically, if you read the listing all the way through and you think, yep, nope, I can do that, I can do that, I can do that, I can do everything that they're needing, then you can audition. And also pricing is a big deal for a lot of narrators. There's there's a whole online war that happens anytime you mention <laughs> pricing. Ah, but yeah, that's how I choose. Yeah, I can imagine pricing is always going to be one of those little sticky wicket kind of questions where everyone's got their, their opinions and uh, it can kind of cause a bit of controversy. But yeah, that's I think it's, I suppose, again, it probably depends with pricing. It probably depends on length of book, type of book. I mean, if you're reading some sort of giant, epic, 200,000 word tome, with massive amounts of characters, your full you know, set of characters, accents and everything, compared to maybe a 50,000 word novel that's got one main character and a couple of side characters, you know. And again, I'm assuming a traditional publisher would probably charge more, would probably that than a self-published author. I don't know. I'm assuming, making random speculation, I'm assuming the price would be higher on a traditional published one? I don't know, just a thought. I think that's probably right. Um, but, but it's really variable. On ACX, when you list a project, you can choose how much you're willing to pay. The, the range, um, the exact price, there's also different ways that you can pay narrators, um, like royalty share. There's also royalty share plus and per finished hour rates. So. There's a whole slew of things that you can choose from and a narrator can say, yep, I'm willing to do that. Or nope, that project's not for me. Just based on the price a lot of times, or I guess not the price, but the payment value. Yeah, that sounds like a whole other side of the whole audiobook scene. So Rachel, we threw quite a bit at you uh, within this past hour. So thank you for keeping up with us. But it's really been great having you on the show. Would you like to share anything about yourself with our listeners? Absolutely. So I was born and raised in Utah, and I live with my husband and my three kids that I mentioned earlier. We also have a sweet little border collie as well. I call her my little mini Mana. She's adorable. Um, and aside from writing and recording, I love acting on stage and singing and playing the piano. I also love those puzzle books that are full of like word searches and sudokus and logic puzzles and stuff that you get at the grocery store. Those are super fun. Uh, basically, my interests are all over the place. Um, I've got two books done out of three for a time travel fairy tale retelling series called The Mirror Chronicles by Rachel Huffmeyer. Apparently, I work with a lot of Rachels. <laughs> Uh, so the Mirror Chronicles is about a renegade time traveler who's made it his job to save people who died or were mistreated back in history. I also have Second Star by Brie Moore, which is a sequel to Peter Pan. But not the Disney version, though. Don't, don't expect the Disney sequel. <laughs> a lot of people don't know that the original Peter Pan story was pretty dark, but the novella reflects that darker feel. You can find me at my website or on Twitter or Instagram and TikTok. I'm also teaching a pre-recorded class, like I mentioned earlier, about how to make a book into an audiobook, going into all of those details on Author, Ca Author Capital's online conference. Oh, that's awesome. So all of Rachel's links will be in the description below, so be sure to go check her out. And thank you again so much for joining us on the podcast. It really has been a delight. But in the meantime, we're going to turn it over to you guys. Have you ever thought of narrating audiobooks before, or have you wanted to work with one on your own book? We'd love to chat about it. So tell us your answers in the comments below. And if you want some more of the Merry Writer podcast, then be sure to follow us on Podbean, YouTube, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. And for as little as $1 a month, you can join us on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash the Merry Writer podcast for bonus content. It really helps keep the show going, so we appreciate the support. And in the meantime, you guys can tune in every Wednesday for a new episode of the Merry Writer podcast where we ask all the right questions. Thanks for listening. Bye. 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 This podcast is brought to you by Reams of Paper. We're killing trees. The music titled Inspired is by Kevin McLeod, licensed under Creative Commons 4.0.